Welcome back to the podcast, Unbinding the Bible. This is episode number 80, Revelation, Sheep in the Midst of Wolves. And the following is a sermon that I preached on June 25th, 2017, while working through the Gospel of Matthew. This is actually the passage that I preached the Sunday immediately after what appears in this podcast as episode 79. And so this is the first time that I've chosen to put two back-to-back sermons in as two back-to-back episodes. But the reason I've chosen to do that is for a couple of reasons. Um, The first is that it, it ties together some themes of the Destroyer that we looked at in episode 78 as Jesus draws our attention to the kinds of things that the enemy is seeking to do to Christians while they are in the process of being faithful witnesses to Jesus. And that's a second reason why I wanted to bring this to your attention is because the entire book of Revelation is focused on Christians being faithful witnesses. And here is, in fact, Jesus's um, promise to them of what will come when they witness, which again is highlighted very significantly for us throughout the book of Revelation. But he also encourages them and and commands them actually to be as innocent as doves, but as wise as serpents. And I think in our day right now, um, possibly more than many of us have realized in quite a number of years, is a very high need for us in dependence upon the Holy Spirit to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves in the ways that we choose to live in the ways that we choose to respond to this coronavirus and recognizing once again that despite things like this, um, these do not take God by surprise, but has always promised to be with his people, showing them how to take difficult trials and circumstances and, and to apply wisdom to those circumstances so that they're able to continue carrying out what he's calling us to do. And so I offered to you this message, I hope, as an additional encouragement along the way through Revelation. I continually want us to remember a number of things as we work our way through that book. And that is that we are called to be witnesses, but we need to recognize that the presence of obstacles to that witness is not a sign that we're doing something wrong. It very well may be proof that we are doing something right. And yet the posture that Christians need to adopt while seeking to be witnesses is very, very important. And I'm afraid in times like this, sometimes the things that we are tempted to say or the ways we are tempted to react might not come across with as much compassion and heartfelt concern for those who are really struggling as we should. And so, of course, this sermon was not preached um, with COVID-19 in my mind. This was preached nearly three years ago. And so I'm not asking you to think about how it applies to COVID-19, although I think you might find that there are times where I address issues of fear, fear in our witnessing, fear in what's going on around us. And Jesus will deal with fear right in the heart of this passage. And so that might even be an additional reason of why I think this podcast Uh, This sermon, rather, will fit well at at this time in the podcast. So I realized on my recording that I do not have the passage itself recorded. So allow me just to read it here for you in the introduction, and then we will get into the sermon itself. This is Matthew 10, 16 through 33. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious about how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next, for truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel 
before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them. For nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. And so without any further introduction, I offer to you the sermon, Sheep in the Midst of Wolves. I still remember the day I learned to love roller coasters. For most of my life, I've been deathly afraid of heights. Well, probably a bit more accurately, deathly afraid of falling. But on this particular day, when I was 17 years old, my older sister was determined to get me to ride the Raptor at an amusement park called Cedar Point, which is in Sandusky, Ohio. With feet freely dangling and twists and turns flipping you upside down no less than six times, reaching speeds upwards of 67 miles per hour, the Raptor is not for the faint of heart. But she just kept pleading with me to ride it with her. You'll love it, she assured me. It's the most exciting feeling in the world. But the only way to enjoy it fully, she added, is to ride it at night, seated in the very front. (laughs) Now, there was a part of me that knew... uh, Actually, there was a part of me that was terrified of what she was asking me to do, and yet there was another part of me that knew maybe she was right about the thrill So somewhat reluctantly and somewhat expectantly, I agreed to ride it. I still remember the slow clicking sound of the chain that pulls the car toward the top of the first drop. It's very methodical, very rhythmic, and very, there's no going back now, buddy. (laughs) As we climbed in elevation, I began to see the park from a very different perspective and a very exciting one. Seeing Cedar Point so far below us, beneath us, made me, made the whole new, gave me a whole new perspective on things. And as I continued checking my harness to make certain I was safely secured in my seat, the clicking of the chain began to fade into the background. For we had made it to the very top, and now each row of seats, one by one, was being released from the chain and given over to gravity to allow it to do its thing. And for what seemed like an eternity, although I now know was only a few seconds, our front seat slowly peered over the edge of the 160-foot drop, ready to plummet to what I feared was certain death. Only we weren't falling. We were just hanging there, waiting for the rest of the rows behind us to catch up and push us over the edge. And in that moment, I just held my breath and begged God to protect my life. And he did. And so much more. He not only protected me, but he tore my fear of roller coasters right out of me and allowed me to experience the pure thrill of the twists and turns and flips with an exhilaration and joy I never even imagined. Fear was replaced with joy. And the first thing I did when the ride was over was to begin longing for the day when I could go back to Cedar Point and do it all over again. Now, I believe that when Jesus first gave his disciples authority to cast out demons and to heal the sick, they experienced something similar to my perspective change as the chain took me to the top of the raptor. Whole new worlds open up to you when you grasp the honor we've been granted in Christ to exercise his authority in the world. But then quite suddenly... 
we find that we're looking over the edge of a precipice. And we're going to be hurled down whether we like it or not. And all you can think to do is beg God to protect your life. Jesus promises that just such a prayer will be answered. For you see, the thrill ride of standing in Jesus' authority and exercising it on his behalf will pose fearful threats to us. It's just a fact. His calling on our lives brings with it some unsettling realities. And so Jesus addresses those realities along with our tendency to shy away from the thrill of it all out of fear. Fear is real, and Jesus knows it. Fear of the unknown. Fear of what might happen to us. Fear of what others will say or think about us. Fear that we won't know what to say when we find ourselves in an uncomfortable situation. Fear is real, yes, because the one behind all the fear is real. But our calling to exercise Jesus' authority on his behalf is also real. And he wants us to see the relationship between the two so that we will serve our Father in heaven and not shy away from his calling on our lives because of the danger that awaits us if we do. So if you have a Bible and there are a few under the final seats and the edge seats of your row, I would invite you to open it to Matthew chapter 10 to the passage that I just read before you a few minutes ago. Right out of the gate, Jesus describes the life that needs to characterize his disciples. And if you remember from our passage from last Sunday, where he hands his disciples his authority and tells them to exercise it in his name, to cast out demons, to heal the sick, and to minister his presence in the world. And so here's what he says to his disciples, starting in verse 16. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be shrewd as serpents. Some translations say wise, but shrewd is really, it captures it a little bit better. Be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. Now, to embrace both innocence and shrewdness is a really tall order. Many Christians find it easy to be one or the other, but rarely both. Without innocence, though, shrewdness can very easily become manipulation. And without shrewdness, innocence very easily can become naivety. What we need if we are to properly navigate this new world of exercising Jesus' authority is this finely balanced character, innocence and shrewdness perfectly reflecting the kind of character Jesus himself exhibited when he walked the earth. But why? Why do we need both innocence and shrewdness? Well, Jesus will never call his people to do anything unethical. Ever. He is every bit as interested in the proper shaping of our character as he is in defeating the works of the devil. So he would in no way ever approve of us sacrificing moral principles in order to carry out his authority. We must be innocent. But he also knows how the enemy works. And it takes a high level of wisdom and perceptive thinking to rightly discern what's really going on in the world. Far too few Christians today recognize that they've been given Jesus' authority and that they are actually in a spiritual war as a result. They often fight as if their battle is against flesh and blood, when it's really against the principalities and rulers in the heavenly places. Only the shrewd among God's people recognize this, and as a result, see the difficulties in their lives as attacks on them precisely because they are following Jesus. Here's how John describes it in Revelation 12. Then the dragon, code for Satan, became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. The enemy hates Jesus and all those who follow him. He hates them. Yes, this means Christians those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Testimony, bearing witness to Jesus' authority in the world. And so Jesus warns us as to what to expect in this fight, where to place our hope, 
and why trusting in the Father's love and protection for us is the only way that we will ever endure to the end. And here's what he says in verse 17. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. First and foremost, what we need to understand is that the announcement and the exercising of Jesus' authority poses a real threat to every other authority structure in place. Men will deliver you over to courts, secular places seeking justice and peace. But they will also deliver you over to receive floggings in their synagogues, religious places of worship. Secular or religious, it doesn't matter. The enemy will use any form of authority in his power to thwart the proper use of our authority. And he will use our fear of having to give a well-reasoned answer in the face of that authority to bully us into keeping quiet. This is happening all around us today. Do you see this? Christians in the public square are constantly being put on the spot by politicians and by news reporters. And they are questioned as to their views on religious syncretism, right? Aren't all religions just basically the same? How can you say that these people worship something that's not going to actually land them in heaven one day? Or they're accused of hate crimes because they share Jesus' views on morality and don't heartily embrace society's ever-changing views. And the thought of being called out like that to express your faith in Christ is daunting to many people. It's paralyzing to others. So many people just keep quiet about their faith. But Jesus asks us to be shrewd in how we understand what's really going on. They will drag you before governors and kings, but I am leading you so that you might bear witness about me before them. You see what's happening. The authority structures in this world think they're dragging you to mock you, to shame you. Jesus says, oh, no, they're not. This is all in my hands. They're actually being sent by me to those places so that you can bear witness about me there. This is, after all, what we've been called to do. Jesus tells his disciples this in Acts chapter 1 when he reminds them, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So even here, Jesus goes to great lengths to remind his disciples that when they're dragged before these rulers and they don't know what to say because they find themselves in a position they never wanted or asked to be put in, not to be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Remember, Jesus has taken the enemy's attempts at threatening you and frightening you and has used them to give you an opportunity to bear witness about him. And the confidence you and I have that the Spirit will in fact give us exactly what to say and how to say it is rooted in what Jesus tells his disciples about the Spirit. He will glorify me. The Spirit's primary role is to point the world to Jesus. So when you're faced with an unexpected, unlooked-for opportunity to be a witness for Jesus, rest assured that the Spirit will equip you with everything you need to speak on his behalf. Ask him for the humility to speak honorably about Jesus in that moment. Ask him to allow you to rest in his leading and not look for answers yourself. Ask him for clarity to discern what needs to be said and then ask him for the boldness and wisdom to say it. Jesus promises that's exactly what he'll give you. So don't be afraid that you won't know what to say when those unexpected times arise. The Holy Spirit will give you exactly what you need to say. But also, don't be afraid of what others will choose to say about you if and when you faithfully witness for Jesus. Here's a second caution 
that Jesus needs to put in place because this one has derailed countless millions of believers who were not ready for this kind of challenge. A disciple is not above his master, Jesus says. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? Now, having someone question your motives when you're doing something good is hard to handle. But having someone claim that you are in league with the devil when you are actually serving Jesus can stop you dead in your tracks. And there are a lot of people who don't know what to do with that. When accusations come, they want to attack the person through whom the accusations are coming. So Jesus subtly reminds his disciples that even at the height of his powerful ministry, he was accused of exercising his authority in Satan's power. This is nothing new. So don't be thrown off course when it happens to you. The enemy at his best is an accuser. He's a destroyer. He works tirelessly to cause us to doubt whether what we're doing is truly from the right spirit or not. And when he convinces us that it isn't, he attacks us with those doubts, oftentimes using others to discourage us in our attempts at following Jesus. And why does this happen? Well, again, the enemy knows that his time is short. He knows that Jesus truly does have all authority in heaven and earth and that it is entirely within Jesus' right to share that authority with us. If we believe Jesus on this point and begin to rightly exercise the authority we've been given on earth, Satan's kingdom will be in serious, serious trouble. And so he subtly works behind the scenes through authority structures, courts and synagogues, other people. Our fear of not knowing what to say. Others bad-mouthing us or calling us names. And the general doubts and discouragements that we face every day to shift us away from our singular focus. Ministering Jesus' healing presence in his name throughout the world. But Jesus wants us to know who our real enemy is. It's not the people who malign us or the authority structures before which we're dragged. They are simply pawns in the enemy's game. So Jesus tells us plainly, Do not fear those who kill the body, but who cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, for years, I had an interpretation of this verse. In fact, most of my life, I've had a particular interpretation of this verse. This is what I used to think this verse meant. Don't fear Satan, who can only kill the body. Rather, fear God, who can destroy both soul and body in hell. But as of two days ago, I realized that this is wrong. Satan, not God, comes to destroy The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, Jesus says. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. For Jesus says, fear the one, and then two verses later when speaking of the Father, says to us, fear not. Why? Well, Jesus tells us in verse 29, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. The flow of thought here simply makes no sense. Fear the one and fear not unless Jesus intends for us to fear the enemy in verse 28. Here's what I think is actually happening here. Jesus is pulling back the veil to show us all what's beneath the surface. Remember, he's asked us to be shrewd in how we exercise his authority. Do not fear the men who malign you or those who threaten you. The worst they can do is take your life. They can kill the body. Rather, fear the one who's using those men to advance his kingdom. The one who... If he can prevent you from witnessing to Jesus in the presence of others, 
can destroy both soul and body in hell. Jesus himself adds these sobering words in verse 32. Everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Acknowledging Jesus before men, that's witnessing. That's what we've been called to do. And the enemy knows that with the authority we've been given, our witness of Jesus actually has power. It is effective and will bring others into the kingdom. And so he works round the clock to prevent us from doing it, scaring us, causing us to doubt, making us think we won't know what to say, making us anxious, using others to discourage us and call us names, or even threatening us. And what is Jesus' answer to all these fears, doubts, anxieties, discouragements, and threats? Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. Fear not, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. The enemy's threats are real. Sure they are. But you are loved and cared for by your heavenly father to such an extent that not a single hair of your head is unaccounted for. We are his children, and he will be with us every step of the way. Jesus has chosen to share his authority with us. It's an exhilarating reality just to ponder, much less actually walk into And the Father promises not only to protect us while we exercise this authority, but like my ride on the raptor, will tear our fear of witnessing right out of us and allow us to experience the pure thrill of the twists and the turns with an exhilaration and joy we never even imagined. Fear will be replaced with joy. And we will want nothing more than to be repeatedly put in situations where we can allow him to work in and through us in enemy territory and share in the victory his son won for us in the cross and in the resurrection. So do not be afraid of where the Father may lead you as you witness for Jesus. Fear the alternative instead, that through shrinking away from testifying to Jesus, you will find yourself in league with the one who seeks your total destruction. Fear not, Jesus says, for in the eyes of your father, you are of more value than many sparrows and he will protect you. And that is something we can all rejoice in.